The order was totally random except for the first person because I need to get her surname out of the way because it's really stressful. Um, so with the topic, how the Siberian wilderness helped me to reconnect, ladies and gentlemen, my friend from Lithuania, Jergita Stasikutite. Hi, everyone. You are probably wondering, why would anyone go to Siberia? It's cold, remote, wild, and vast, and full of mosquitoes. Sounds like an ideal holiday destination, isn't it? Seven years ago, I was living on the edge of balancing full-time studies, part-time work, personal life, and also trying to enjoy the snippets of student life. I was full of hopes, dreams, and aspirations, and my heart was craving for an adventure. And then one day, I discovered an expedition called Mission Siberia. The idea of getting close to my country's history in such a thrilling way equally fascinated and scared me. So I decided to give it a shot. To give a little bit of context, in most parts of Siberia, there is no Facebook or internet. And you can imagine that. You actually have to talk to people. It isn't as scary as it sounds, but it's not something that we in a digital world used to. Siberia is wild. From high mountains to never-ending Siberian forest, from fr freezing nights in winter to really, really hot days in summer. It's a region of contrast, and at the same time, it's really, really stretching your mindset. So first obstacle that I encountered is brown bears. If you ever thought that your neighbor is loud, intrusive, and has some sort of tendency to leave some sort of footprints around, think of having a wild bear as a neighbor. Second, mosquitoes. They emerge earlier, grow faster, and live longer than anywhere else in the world. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and from my own experience, they just love foreign blood. Third, no water. Imagine, you are in the deep Siberian taiga, far away from civilization, and all you have is a swamp. Yes, even after filtering and boiling three times, this water looked exactly like in the slide. Yes. And if you are asking yourself, yes, I did drink it. Fourth, Carrying heavy and large backpacks for an extended period of time was a really big physical challenge for me. I not only started seeing white horses running in front of me, but also counting the trees in order to stay focused and not to fall asleep. So to sum up, Siberia is wild, really, really remote, and full of mosquitoes. But why am I telling you this? Do I want to scare you? No, not at all. I actually want to encourage you to do things that scare you and share my learnings with you. First, we need to make time for ourselves. Time alone in Siberia actually showed me that I need to do more, I need to dream more, I need to travel the world. And that's what I've been doing for seven years since then. Second, we need to connect with others. And not just spend time with others, but actually connect with them. So time in Siberia showed me that when we actually listen to people, connect to them, we build friendship that lasts a lifetime. Third, we need to pay attention to our surroundings. Whether it's navigating through Siberian wilderness or South African roads full of taxes, small details often lead us to major discoveries and quite often prevent us from really serious accidents. And fourth, so after all those challenges, bears and mosquitoes, Siberia isn't that scary. It actually showed me that if you have a common goal that unites people and challenges them to act, everything is possible. So the message I want to leave with you today is very simple. Sometimes all we need to do is to disconnect in order to connect with ourselves, people around us, and surroundings. Thanks. Mr. Brett Lowe, and he's speaking, his, his title is To the Bottom of the Top. Hi, good evening. Okay, so this quote by Mark Twain was something that I read before I started my trip um, three years ago to Everest Base Camp. So it's just pretty much what I want to speak about, and that no longer when you hit 40, just go out and try stuff and don't be afraid to go and try it really hard. So um, like any good idea, it started about 16 years ago after miles too many beers, and my friend and I were discussing how you should, what would you really like to do, and let's go to Everest Base Camp came up. It was about three o'clock in the morning, um, 17 years later, we finally got to do it. So like any um, avid hiking person, you're gonna do a bit of training. So we went to the highest peak in the Western Cape, which is a total of 1,700 meters. 
Uh, I nearly died doing that, by the way. That's an eight-hour hike, and it's pretty hectic. Then I did a bit of research um, on our trip and where we're going to. Don't ever search for Lukla. It's the most dangerous airport in the world. So at the end of that runway is about a 2,000-meter cliff with lots of airplanes piled up in a pile at the bottom of it. So, yeah. <laughs> Trying to do technology. So uh, all these guys that have their Fitbits and everything, have you ever climbed 116 flights of stairs in, in one day? And that's pretty much what we were doing. And then for internet, we use this old piece of paper, which is the good old scratch and get your code for Wi-Fi in these places. Life is pretty simplistic. So literally anything that goes up or down that mountain either goes on a yak or on the back of a Sherpa. And it's, um, it's a tough landscape. As the, the rocks show there, there, there really isn't much around there. It's, it's rocks and uh, a lot of water. <laughs> it's pretty tough. But you're also reminded of um, all the people that have tried to go up. There's a big memorial there with a lot of dead bodies. And the poor guy on the right's not a dead body, but that's the equipment that they used to use. So in today's modern world with K-Way and everything else, that sort of stuff, we've got it much easier than the guys did in the past. Um, it's also important then to you know, appreciate the, the guys that did it in 1953 and got to the top there. So there's a huge focus on those Sherpa people. Um, it's a huge honor to be a Sherpa, particularly a mountain Sherpa. So, you know, that photo, first photograph of Everest in the background is, is pretty cool. And then don't be afraid of heights. So this is, we watched the Everest movie before my mate and I went. Also another big mistake. That's the swing bridge in it. And they don't drink and smoke on Everest like in the movie. Trust me, you, you can't bloody breathe, never mind smoke and drink. It can be quite lonely. So if you ever stand on your own with mountains that are, the small ones are 6,000 meters, there's no one around, it's dead quiet. Um, you really think there may be something else out there other than just yourself. So it's a, a great learning experience. And then the, the end of it is a huge elation because it's, it's really pretty tough to pretend that you're climbing something and breathing through a straw. You have no idea how much you appreciate oxygen thereafter. So yeah, go out and have your dreams and have fun. <laughs>
in terms of uh, voting, we've seen the ANC offer free Wi-Fi. We've seen Kenya offer electronic voting. There's some really awesome opportunities from M government and the ability to bridge the digital divide and get more of the masses involved with internet freemium models. You're not allowed to talk while I'm talking, huh? Excuse me, Andre, you've got to pay attention. Uh, mobile health. Pay attention. Mobile health is, is really another way because Africa is so scattered, okay, and it's such a big geographic uh, environment, the ability to offer a doctor 24-7 to people in remote areas is really an unbelievable opportunity. Uh, there's a big opportunity to create jobs within agriculture, and um, there's a great example there around Kenya's agriculture. It's called Kosoni SMS 64, where you can get lots of prices around uh, agriculture. Some other real examples in Hong Kong and uh, Gov Wi-Fi and our Wi-Fi hotspots moved from two th in 2008 from 7,900 to 30,000. And um, everybody wants free Wi-Fi. I think if Meslo was around, it will be at the top of the hierarchy of needs. And in terms of the unique opportunity for Africa, we really believe that there's going to need more competition uh, and more ad-supported models to get more Africans connected to the internet. Thank you for your valuable time and your attention. Brownie Martin, uh, come fly with me. I think it's true to say that at any point in time, whatever I'm doing, I'd rather be flying. I'm very lucky to be able to fly this beautiful machine, call sign Zulu Sierra Lima Echo Alpha, and we call her Lee affectionately. That feeling when your wheels leave the ground is amazing. Every single time there's this sense of freedom. That's also the moment when things get real. So you need to earn that by going through quite a disciplined process leading up to that of checklists. There's a checklist for pretty much everything, sometimes more than one. And there's a lot of items on there, but most of them reflect checks around three critical things. The airframe, the instruments, and the engine. So the airframe is the physical plane itself, and once you're flying it, you can't see it anymore. So during your pre-flight inspection, you walk around the plane and examine and touch every single surface to make sure that it's safe to fly. When pilots talk about instruments, they often talk about the six-pack. And those are the six key instruments that are located directly in front of the pilot that tell you how high you are, how fast you're going, what direction you're going in, and whether the plane is climbing, descending, or turning. The engine is probably the most important thing. It creates thrust, which pulls the plane forward through the air, creating lift. And this lift force is what keeps you in the sky. But there's a lot of critical decisions that have to be made before you even leave the ground. Every item in those checklists is a chance for the pilot to ask herself to fly or not to fly. Once you've decided to go, this checklist helps you configure your plane. And you'll see the last item there is the emergency briefing. This is something that the pilot, where the pilot briefs herself on what to do in the event of an engine failure after takeoff. Height gives you time, and time gives you options. And just after takeoff, if something goes wrong, you're not going to have either. So you need to be ready, and I'm going to teach you how. In the event of an engine failure after takeoff, I will lower the nose for best glide of 95 miles per hour. Identify a field 30 degrees either side of the nose. Conduct a fault find if there's time. Issue a medical, shut down and land. So what does that mean? Best glide of 95. That's the speed that will give you the furthest range in the event of your engine failing. It's based on the physical structure of the plane and flying faster or slower than that will reduce your options. Why 30 degrees? Because as tempting as it is, don't turn around. You might have just left a perfectly good runway, but you won't make it back. You lose a precious 500 feet just in the turn alone, so rather find somewhere in front of you that you can safely reach. Only once you're at best glide and you know where you're going to land, do you try and restart the engine. Check the fuel supply, change the power settings, crank the ignition, and try any other engine-related instruments that you have in front of you. You want to let someone know what's going on so that they can send help once you're on the ground. Mayday, mayday, mayday. Lanceria, this is Lima Echo Alpha. We are experiencing an engine failure and will be performing a forced landing to the east of the field. One crew, two packs. 
Just before landing, you want to shut down to reduce any risk of fire. So turn off the fuel supply, turn off the electrical master switch, and turn off the ignition. You also want to open the door so that if there's any distortion of the airframe on landing, you can get out. And then just before landing, tell your passengers to brace, brace, brace. And then forget about them and fly. <laughs> you want to touch down softly and slowly and avoid any obstacles. And once you're on the ground, get out, breathe, and say hi to the sheep. So Tara Knight and her theme or title is All Pole Dancers Are Strippers. Yes, that's right. I also fly, but a lot lower. <laughs> Ooh. Okay, my slides look a little bit funny. Okay, my name is Tara Knight. The formatting seems to have gone a little bit funny, but um, I have been working at Volkswagen for 11 years. I'm now responsible for the medium and light commercial vehicles and buckies. As you can imagine, this is the most male-dominated of a very male-dominated industry. But in my spare time, of which there is a little, this is me. I've been pole dancing. I've been pole dancing off and on for about nine years. And uh, a while back, I was asked to be a brand ambassador of Xpole South Africa. What is Xpol? Xpol is the leading manufacturer of aerial fitness equipment. By aerial fitness, I'm sure you know the Lira and the Silks, but I'm going to be talking to you about the most controversial, which is the pole. <laughs> this, this is my sport, this is what I do, and this is what I love. I love the grace and the elegance and the strength of pole fitness. <laughs> but unfortunately, when I'm standing up here in front of all of you and when I tell my colleagues, this is what they think I do, okay? You're talking about men who watched Demi Moore in striptease and who used to have their business meetings in questionable venues. This is what they think. But I mean, it started in like the late 1800s, right? With all these burlesque dancers and hoochie coochie girls. No actually, go back 800 years, it actually started in the 13th century. You might have heard of Chinese pole. You've maybe been to Cirque du Soleil. And maybe you've heard of Malakam, which is Indian pole. And that is actually still practiced in the army, and it is the official sport in 14 states of India. And I'm sorry, but I really don't see the difference in what they're doing and what we're doing. It looks kind of similar, right down to the amount of bare skin that these guys are showing. And trust me, you want a lot of skin when you don't know what's going to be gripping the pole to stop you from falling. And now, pole is on its way to the Olympic sports. Oh my word, what are we going to do? Is it really that different to rhythmic gymnastics and some of the other stuff we've been watching for years and years in the Olympics? And yet this is still what I get all the time when I say I'm a pole dancer. So I give up, I'm gonna accept it, and I'm gonna give you three characteristics, at least one of which applies to every single pole dancer. Number one, yes, we do dislike clothing. As I've said, the more skin, the better. And they have a lot of amazing outfits, so we wanna try and show off all of them. Okay, number two. We strip people of preconceived ideas. It doesn't matter what gender, age, body type, or even life stage you're in, you can pole. And last but not least, go up to a pole dancer and say, you are definitely a stripper. She will strip. She will strip her moor at you, okay? <laughs> Big time. Okay, so. The only way that a pole dancer is a stripper is if pole stands for strong, tough, resolute, imaginative person, persistently engaging in rotation. And I have to apologize about this slide. It looked amazing on my non-Mac. Thank you very much. How to extend to the ends of the earth. There we go. Yeah. <laughs>
Give me a poll. Give me a poll. A few years ago, I got invited to um, the Israeli president, Shimon Peres's 90th birthday. And Barbara Strassen came to sing her happy birthday. Bill Clinton was there, Rahm Emanuel, Tony Blair, and me. But probably the highlight of all of this was a guy called Daniel Gilbert, the world expert on happiness. And he had one lesson for all of us on happiness. He said, don't buy yourself physical possessions, buy yourself life experiences. So I decided to start a journey to travel the world to see some of the most remarkable things that the world had to offer and to photograph some of them so I could share it with you here tonight. So 74 countries later, I have traveled, for example, into the tundra of Norway to the Sami tribesmen living in their, their uh, teepee tents made out of reindeers, the closest thing that you will ever come to see Father Christmas. That guy, 600 reindeers. In the jungles of Borneo, I realized that orangutans were in fact more human than most humans. It started to rain, a female orangutan walked out of the, the jungle and took a cardboard box and used it as an umbrella on her head. And in Nepal, after wandering on elephant back through the jungles of Nepal looking for tigers, you take your elephant down to the river and you bath each other in the river as the elephant splashes you. In places like the Amazon jungle, in the Rio Negro, where the Amazon is black, black, you can't see, you dive into the water with pieces of fish and the pink blind dolphins swim up to you and literally play with you in the Amazon. In places like Bolivia, where the deserts are flat and made entirely of salt, 10 meters underground. You stay in hotels where the chairs are made of salt, the desks are made of salt, the beds are made of salt, and the only thing you can't have with salt is your food, because you just wipe it across the table made of salt. <laughs> in Panama, two and a half hours off the coast of Panama, you come to these islands in the middle of nowhere, where you spend just in the middle of the ocean. Or in Guilin and Yangshua in China, you get on a bicycle and you go cycling through the rice paddies and you stop at people's farms and you drink sake that they've made themselves. But most important of all are the people that you meet. This gentleman that you see in this picture is the last surviving member of Che Guevara's brigade. He was with Che Guevara where he overturned a train in Cuba, winning them the Cuban Civil, civil War. And in Burma, on top of a mountain where no Westerner had been before, this monk took out his most prized possession to show me a gramophone. And then I took out my iPad and showed it to him, and he asked me if we'd swap. <laughs> That's Western consumerism for you. But here, you're looking at a picture of Pacaya in Guatemala, where I hiked up a volcano with a bag full of cheese and tomato and bread, because I could actually bry toasted cheese sandwiches on the lava. And here in Banawi and Batad, in one of the most obscure places in the world where you live in a little wooden hut on the edge of a, of a, of a crevice overlooking the oldest rice terraces in the world. But ultimately, the message I want to leave you with, in Sri Lanka, in Nogombo, in the hanging the hanging gallows of Nogombo, where people died, you realize there's only one lesson. The only answer for a good death is actually a happy life. Okay, astronomical explanations for the star of Bethlehem. Yeah, so Christmas time, and uh, I'm sure most of you have heard uh, the story of the star of Bethlehem. The question though is, is it bullshit? Or is there a possible explanation? Um, maybe it's Matt's creative side coming out. So the story goes that a new star appeared to the east, which the wise men from the east interpreted as a sign that a new king to the Jews would be born. They then followed the star to Jerusalem and on to Bethlehem, where it stopped over the place where they found baby Jesus. Now, there's been a lot of speculation about what the star could have been. Some reckon it could be a meteor, a supernova, or a comet. However, they don't meet the necessary criteria. For one, they certainly can't suddenly stop. Um, they were also associated with the four Ds, doom, death, disease, and disaster. To find a plausible explanation, we first have to understand who these wise men were. Now, they were probably astrologers from Babylon, today's Baghdad, um, called the Magi. And uh, these are the dudes that gave us the horoscopes. 
So the Magi derived signs from uh, phenomena like occultations and eclipses and uh, conjunctions, and uh, they believed, as the Greeks and the Romans did, that the planets were actually gods, wandering across the skies, visiting the constellations or the houses of the zodiac. Now, astronomers believe that the star of Bethlehem was probably a planet, but can planets stand still? And indeed, they can. As seen from Earth, as Earth laps out the planet, the, sp the planet stops against the starry background, moves slightly backwards, and then continues. Using modern planetary software, we can now go back in time and look for a, a possible explanation. We need to look for um, Leo, the Lion of Judah, Virgo, the Virgin, and then also the planets Jupiter, Venus, and Mercury. Now, there's, uh, there's compelling evidence that Jesus was born in 2 BC. That means there's a two-year mistake in our calendar. And uh, I'm now going to show you what I found using the planetarium software called Stellarium. Uh, starting with Annunciation, when Gabriel supposedly visited Mary, we can see Jupiter in perfect conjunction with Regulus rising on the east, closely followed by Venus, Mercury, and the Sun, in the constellation of Virgo. Now, this would have been a definite sign to the Magi that a king to the Jews would be born and would have a virgin birth. On a side note, virgin birth wasn't a new concept. It was believed that very important kings descended from the gods and therefore had miraculous or virgin births. Some of the examples include Emperor Augustus, the pharaohs of Egypt, and uh, Alexander the Great. Now, moving on to the birth, Exactly nine months after the Annunciation, looking towards the west from Babylon, we see Jupiter briefly appear in perfect conjunction with Venus. This would have been the most amazing thing the Magi has ever seen. Imagine the king of the gods visit the goddess of fertility, a clear sign the king was born. They decide to travel to Jerusalem, they have the little chit chat with King Herod, and then they, uh, they eagerly look at the skies, looking for more signs as to where the baby king could be. Then they witness something really amazing. So starting from September 2 BC, watch closely as Jupiter moves down the arm of the Virgin. And then exactly on 25 December, the, first, the very first Christmas day, Jupiter comes to a standstill above the southern horizon at 68 degrees, shining down on Bethlehem, since Bethlehem is only about... 10 kilometers south of Jerusalem. From there, turns around, moves up the arm of the Virgin, and uh, that's it. The Star of Bethlehem. Dr. Carolee Rodman, and her theme is Why Does Machine Learning Work So Well? Exciting topic, right? Okay, hi. I'm Carolina, and I'm a scientist, and as such, I'm going to use my four minutes to try to explain the scientific reason why machine learning works so well, and why it works even at all. The answer is physics, the science of extracting the essence of, what com of the complexity that surrounds us. So what is machine learning? Algorithms that figure out features and sharpen them. You have a model, you have some data, and you have a better model for it. It's essentially statistics. Now, let's first look at the role of the data. This is where the performance or the bias of the machine learning algorithm is determined. This is the first page of a Google image search for face front. You'll notice that Google returns two animals, but only one face of a black person. Now, that's the stuff that will bias your algorithm. True enough, when my husband and I are trying to take a cult cutesy couple selfie, his phone only sees one face. So here I'm taking a picture of his phone as we're selfieing away. Needless to say, face palm. So that's for the data. Now the model. What goes into a model is first the features that matter, and then how they combine. How they combine is mathematics. So a model is a mathematical combination of features that matter. The better the model fits the data, the better the model. But how many, how many mathematical functions of these features do we need to test? The reality is that this number is way too high to be able to test to fit data, even with all the existing computational resources in the world, by far. So let's illustrate this. This is an example. Say you have five features, A, B, C, D, E. Model one, very easy to figure out. Model two, less so. See, so if you, let's start with your brains instead, biological intelligence. The question is, what comes next? I tell you, zero, one, two, three, four, five, all your brains scream six at me, it's beautiful. I tell you, three, one, four, one, five, two, nine, 
a couple of geeks will figure it out, but there's no clear pattern. Now imagine all co possible combinations of numbers, rather not. So, to repeat the key question from this paper that's, that this talk is based on, why is it even possible? How come machine learning algorithms even find answers, considering how many mathematical functions there are? So without throwing jargon like Hamiltonians into this, the first part of the answer is that the real world is rarely more complex than this. This is a polynomial of the fourth order. It is a simple mathematical function, and simple functions like that are enough to generate the whole universe. <laughs> The second part of the answer is a lovely property of statistics. It all comes down to bell curves. Don't you love that? Bell curves are simple. They have a center, they have a width. That's all you need to know. So let's come back to the real world. Um, so, fundamental physics, about 32 parameters, combining in sort of fourth order polynomial fashion, creates all of this diversity, beautiful complexity that we see all around that. How cool is that? Now, similarly, with just a few features, like two eyes, one nose, one mouth, a well-trained machine learning algorithm can spot a face, in spite of the incredible diversity of faces in the human race. So, but that's not all there is to it. Unlike nature, machine learning can be hacked. In this case, these guys put square um, and rectangular stickers, black and white, on a stop sign for an autonomous vehicle to interpret this as, well, it's a 45 miles per hour speed limit. You can imagine the disaster, right? <laughs> But it's okay, the machine keeps learning. So, in conclusion, the reason machine learning even works is thanks to the fact that the underlying physics have relative mathematical simplicity. And thanks to that, we can pretty much trust our machine learning algorithms. Thank you. <laughs> ben Schroeder, and his uh, topic is cultural differences and why it's important to recognize them. My name is Ben, and I'm indeed German. I've been living in South Africa for 10 years. And I want to talk to you about today about the German language, why um, it's, uh, everything sounds better in German, why you, why you probably know a lot of German without knowing it. Um, and the reason why you should care about this is because your constitution says you should care, right? German is, is recognized as a common language in South Africa. About 25,000 people speak it. Um, uh, you're probably using a lot of radio without knowing it. After this, you want to learn more, and it's a great conversation starter over a beer. This is a slide that I normally start my conversations with, because otherwise people try to figure out my accent and not listen to me. I'm from Bremen in northern Germany. That's where this beer is from, which you get in alcoholic uh, version. Here you can't, and we buy it in cases. I came for love. That's my wife on our wedding day. I also was very curious about South Africa and Africa because uh, I've never been here before, and obviously the weather. Now, on a side note, if you plan to marry into an Indian family, I've got some tips for you. A, a boot is a bar at any function, whether it's a wedding or a funeral. If you can't remember names, uh, auntie and uncle gets, gets you everywhere. You kiss everybody, you kiss everybody, and you eat a lot and get takeaway in plastic cups. Anyway, I'm digressing. Some questions I get asked a lot. What is fresh luft? It means fresh air. That tweet is accurate. Do you only drink beer and sausages? No. Have you ever driven on the Autobahn? Yes, it's a highway. I do it quite frequently. Do you have to shout or speak to, uh, to speak German? No, and you're watching too many World War II movies. Ausge um, the Wörter. In German, we've got a couple of English words. For instance, this we call a handy. The projector of this we call a beamer. Um, we call a underwear a slip, and other way around, we've got some English words, as German words, that made it into the English language, like Angst, which means fear, Fest, which means firm, tight, or Oktoberfest, Uber, which Justin and team made famous, means above, greater, or higher, Kaputt, which means broken, Kindergarten, Beer Garden, you would know those, and Schadenfreude, the pleasure of derived from the misfortune of others. <laughs> now, there's a couple of words that you don't have, that you wish you had, because they're so great. And I'll give you some of those, right? The first one, Torschluss Panik. Literally means gate closing panic. The fear of diminishing opportunities as you age. Schnapps Idee, an idea you had while drunk that you'll regret tomorrow. And Fernweh, the long pain of far places, and we all know that one. Next one. Kuddel Muddel, Tova Bohu. Brilliant. Right? An unstructured mess of chaos. Arschgeige. This is the softer cousin of the other Arsh word. <laughs> Fremdschämen, which is stranger shame, to feeling ashamed of, on behalf of someone else. Um, 
Now, to finish up, I've got a couple of words for you that I asked some of the followers, fellow streamers to say for us so you can listen to this language a little bit more. And uh, got a little video because they're essential and we can talk about it afterwards. The first one is Umweltverschmutzung. Umweltverschmutzung. Very good, very good. Next one, Schlittschuhlaufen. Schlitzschuhlaufen. Schlitzschuhlaufen. Schlittschuhlaufen. He's so proud, Pete. Well done. He's actually German, I'm, I'm convinced. Uh, Streichholzschächtelchen. Streichholzschächtelchen. Streichholzschlitzchen. Streichholzschächtelchen. That's me. Thank you very much. Auf Wiedersehen. Our next speaker is uh, Minise Grobler, and her uh, title is Programmers. It's time to make way for girly coders. Okay, so I'm turning 30. Never mind that first slide. I'm turning 30 in about two weeks. So I looked at Forbes 30 under 30, and about 12 women are represented there. So I'm not saying by any means that I am their peer or they are mine, but the statistics are quite. Thank you. Quite shocking. And why I know this is I teach little kids to code, and this was one of our best groups. So we had about eight girls and 14 boys, but girls are always underrepresented. And it's quite shocking because 74% of girls in primary school show an interest in STEM related subjects, although only 0.4 will actually pursue a career in any science, technology, engineering, or maths careers in their future. Yeah, boo. So, so don't worry, the next couple of slides won't be all about hashtag feminism. I'm smart enough to know that boys uh, face uh, the same amount of obstacles as girls do. But the problem is, by the time we get to the workplace, there's simply a lot more peepees walking around than hoo has when it comes to tech offices. And that's the reality. Even here today at this conference, females are underrepresented. So, of course, boo very bad boo. I'm also trying to buy some time for the next slide because of 100 girls entering a BA degree, about 12 of those will actually go into a postgrad in STEM uh, study fields and only three of those will end up in STEM related careers. Now of course there's a lot of traditional reasons for this. One is by the time most women think of starting a family, this is when their male counterparts are up for those awesome promotions. Personally, I feel it is because we are represented in a certain way in pop culture. If you want to have geeky interest, you are all, uh, almost always the drab one or the anime lookalike sex object, so we're nowhere somewhere in the middle. The third reason is that ever present page, ugh, page, wage gap, pay wage gap. Uh, at best, women still earn 8% less than men. We are literally being cut off at our knees when we enter this industry. So science, technology, engineering, and maths. This wasn't supposed to be all doom and gloom because this is exactly the tool we need to level the playing fields for boys and girls to ignite that geeky flame and make sure it keeps burning right through their school careers. So here's what I want you guys to do. If you are a parent, go to the school and ask, what are they doing to include STEM subjects in the school curriculum? If you are just a concerned citizen, if you're an individual or corporate, get involved. Find some initiatives in your area and become a volunteer. Men especially, please be a good role model for young girls interested in this field. And lastly, <laughs> the road I took is I simply taught myself how to do these things. So there's a lot of awesome geeky things out there in the world to learn, and it's simply a matter of taking some time and learning how to solder and how to code. Because the history books are full of the things that boys did and big men did, but we need to tell girls in 2017 that there are amazing things that they can do, and we just need to encourage them to keep doing it and seen. Thank you. <laughs> Gillen Gork uh, on Influence Breakthrough. So there I was, a broke entertainer entrepreneur living with my folks, 
trying to make money by pursuing my childhood dream, which was to travel around the world performing on stages in, all around the globe. You see, the problem was that in 2008 was the great global economic crash, and the first thing companies cut was entertainment budgets, and so that basically killed my entire income. Um, you know, I felt like a failure. I couldn't really support myself, let alone anyone else. But one day, something amazing happened. Someone gave me a CD of the leadership guru, John Maxwell, which was all about how our effectiveness, how our success rises and falls on our ability to influence others. And it became crystal clear to me that if I wanted to increase my success, I needed to increase my ability to influence people. It would help me to lead better. I would be able to market and sell more effectively. So my plan was to take the influence principles that I already used on stage as a mentalist, decode them, and apply them to growing my business. And I'll give you three tips on how I did that. So firstly, if I'm going to present to a crowd that's never seen me before, I'll usually tell them about the extraordinary power of the mind. This creates authority and a sense of expectation that makes it easier for me to guide their thoughts. The second thing, oh, by the way, let me tell you how this works in business as well. There was a, uh, a real estate company in the States that used authority. They trained their receptionists to make an expert introduction when they answer the phone. So, for example, oh, you're looking to rent in Stellenbosch? Let me put you through to Jane. She's actually our head of rentals. She's been with the company for 16 years. She'll definitely be able to help you. And when they did this, they noticed a 20% rise in appointments and a 15% increase in the number of signed contracts. So start looking for ways you can create authority, uh, authority uh, either directly or subliminally. Also... If I'm doing a show, and let's say I want to get someone up to come up and help me, but they seem hesitant, what I'll do is give them something really easy, like ask them a simple question in their seat. Then I'll escalate those commitments, and before they know it, they're up on stage helping me. This is because of the principle of consistency. Jonathan Friedman and Scott Fraser demonstrated this perfectly in California. They went to houses, they were at the big front lawn, they said, will you put this billboard up that says, be a safe driver? Only 20% of people said yes. So they did it again, but first they went to houses, different houses, same neighborhood, and they said, would you put the sticker that says be a safe driver? Many people said yes. They went back two weeks later to those people and said, would you put this big billboard? 76% of people said yes. From 20% to 76% because of consistency. So if you want to get that big business, start with easy commitments and escalate it until that company is giving you all their business. The fear of missing out is the third principle, that if I have someone on stage and I want them to make a certain decision, I'll make that decision seem like something that if they don't do it, they're going to miss out. Because FOMO is a very emotive emotion. It mobilizes people. A hi-fi brand was selling a new set, and all of their marketing said, when you get this new set, you'll get all of these new features, and sales were disappointing. But when they said, when you get the set, you won't miss out on these features, suddenly sales skyrocketed. So you can say the same thing in two different ways to evoke two different emotions, and the emotion of the fear of missing out wins every time. We all need influence breakthroughs in our lives. If you're a leader, you need to influence your team. If you are in sales and marketing, you need to influence your clients. I'm grateful for the influence breakthroughs in my life. In fact, they've taken me around the world. Uh, this is John Maxwell at his home in West Palm Beach, who I managed to meet. And uh, the influence breakthroughs, understanding how to apply the science of influence has literally allowed me to achieve my childhood dream where I've now presented around the world and uh, counting up to 30 countries now. And so my message to you is, no matter who you are, no matter what it is that you want to achieve, literally you are just one influence breakthrough away. Thank you. So Philip is our next speaker, Philip Walton, scratching at, the fl scratching at fleas in a den of lions. That's weird. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I don't know about you guys, but I love to get on my soapbox. And uh, this is one soapbox that I love to talk about a lot, which is I don't have time to scratch at fleas because I'm too busy fighting lions. So I started looking and uh, I found this. Come on. So I found this article by MIT Technology Review looking at 10 breakthrough technologies. Like these are the things that are really important. These are the things that are going to change our lives. They're going to influence our children, the generations to come. Uh, and I thought we'd take a look at five of these because they're, they're obviously very important. The first one is self-driving trucks. Um, I don't know about you, I love this idea, the idea of self-driving trucks. Um, I was coming from Mombasa to Nairobi and uh, got stuck in a jam. It took me four hours to go 10 kilometers. Uh, our truck drivers in Kenya are idiots. Um, Reinforcement learning. You know, as an early developer, uh, I'd love the idea of writing a program that would write programs for myself. 
Unfortunately, we've all seen the movies and we know the uh, end of this evolution is that humans get eliminated. Uh, botnet of things. Uh, I'm a huge proponent of IoT. I really love IoT. When we first started Brick, I did one of the uh, Dragon Den style pitch competitions. Uh, I actually lost to an espresso machine that posts to Facebook your favorite uh, espresso. Pain with your face. I don't know if you know this, but uh, facial recognition doesn't work well on dark skin. Fortunately, that's most of the global south. But the good news is Apple solved this problem with the iPhone X. Uh, unfortunately, subsistence farmers can't afford $1,000 telephones. This is my favorite, a 360 degree selfie. How have we not survived, or how have we survived without this device? I mean, our narcissism has not reached a level that we didn't have a 360 degree selfie. So let's talk about some of the real problems that we're actually facing. I don't know this guy. Um, he talks a lot about some really cool entrepreneurial stuff. He said some nice stuff about Brick, so I like him. Um, and he talked about five lion-sized problems that we're facing in Africa that are worth making some efforts towards. So the first is hunger. You know, you look at the problem of hunger in Africa, and it's everything from we don't do good agricultural techniques, we don't have good supply chain to get the agricultural products to the right place at the right time. But the thing is, we have good land. We have labor. We have all the right pieces. Um, I don't know why it doesn't say that, but this is health. So you look at the problem of health. You know, you guys got, you got guys like Bill Gates that are spending lots of money to solve problems like malaria, but fundamentally it's communities that don't have basic education around preventable diseases. What are we doing to solve that? You leave my leafy suburb in Nairobi and immediately you're surrounded by rubbish. Um, waste is a huge issue. You know, Nairobi, uh, Kenya just made the bold move of eliminating all plastic bags. It's a great start, but it's not enough. We gotta figure out how to do more. Look at education. So as Brick, we tried to tackle this one. It's a vicious beast to try and tackle education. Governments, they spend money in the wrong places. Private companies can't get the scale they need to make their businesses sustainable but there's so much that we need to do to find innovation around education. Same thing on electricity. You know, you look at the small scale of things like solar, we can give somebody a light in their house, but how do we engage industry in taking advantage of the renewable energy resources we have on the African continent? That's a huge issue. Last year, there was only $130 million invested into the African continent. Nigeria, Egypt, Kenya, South Africa. And look at these investments just by SoftBank, 627 million, 1 billion, 1 billion. So I wanna ask you this question, really simple question. What the hell is wrong with this picture? Thank you. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Lerato Shabalala. I'm a recovering journalist. <laughs> Um, I come from, so when the rest of you were out there learning about algorithms, people like me were still romanticizing journalism. Uh, as you know, journalists are known for attending the opening of an envelope and the closing of a tap. So if there's booze, we are there. And what happened throughout the years is that a lot of people were looking at us going, journalism, really? And I was one of those people, soon I realized, actually this is a career that was not gonna work for me. I was getting dissed by people like Donald Trump about fake news. And our newsrooms were empty, and I realized soon enough that what I needed to do was actually get into digital, even though it was scary. <laughs> And as Lionel says, hello, is it Lise you're looking for, Janine? Uh, you can background for me later. And, <laughs> and I realized after joining Cerebra, joining an agency, how important it was to be a vegan <laughs> and have a beard. If you find this offensive, don't. I have some of my best friends are, are vegans. Um, and I learned quickly that journalists and digital marketers have a lot in common. So the last two minutes is me kind of elucidating. Yes, I use the big words on that. So both uh, digital marketers and journalists need sources. But sources for digital marketers probably have thick glasses. Whereas sources for journalists are most likely to look like this. 
or come from a neighborhood that looks like this. Don't worry, I wrote an entire book that was entirely offensive. Uh, I won't plug it here, but you'll find out about it later. So both need sources, right? Both digital marketers and journalists need sources. However, while we're still trying to figure out what a Twitter is, have you heard journalists say, I'm going to have a Twitter, not send a tweet, right? Digital marketers are hitting you with every kind of SEOs. And like as a journalist, those are things that scare you the most. These huge, huge uh, acronyms and jargons that nobody particularly understands. But we have one thing in common. We have a love-hate relationship with social activists. Social activists, digital marketers hate them because eventually they lead you to a crisis. I work on Vodacom, so I know exactly what I'm talking about. And as a journalist, we hate uh, social activists because in their minds, if you don't like it, put it on a placard and complain about it. However, there is one thing that we all agree on. In fact, before I go there, uh, journalists, we look broke because we're broke. <laughs> Digital marketers look like that just because they don't give up. Uh, <laughs> But this is the one thing we agree on. As my friend Danny always says, to quote Hemingway, Hemingway said, I write, drunk, edit, sober. Thank you, guys. Craig Hutzeroth, uh, and his title is What My Father Taught Me. So I know that for many, it's, uh, it's a privilege to know your father. So bear with me while I tell you the story of what my father taught me, um, and also what he taught countless others throughout life. So meet the parents. This is Raymond and Tia. And my life story starts on the 16th of January, 1986, when they walked into a hospital ward and picked me up out of an incubator, which was my home for the previous three months. I'm told that that's how they felt when they saw me for the first time. Um, and I think, as proud parents, they, they started raising me. Um, but I think, much to their dismay, as much as I came across as Simba, that's not Simba. Um, I may have had the mane of hair, but I think that's, that's about it. Um, and I'm pretty sure at that stage they wanted a trade-in. Um, luckily for me, they're amazing people, but we digress, because this is a story about my father and what he taught me. But before we go into the lessons, we need to understand the man that he is. And we need to understand the keystrokes that he so effortlessly employs throughout life. So as a pure mathematics student, his thinking is based on flawless logic. And he always used to have the most simple solutions to the most complex problems. He never used to overcomplicate anything. The one thing that sits in the back of my head is basics. And he would sit in his maths classes and he would make his children write out these basic formulas day in and day out because to him, the small things were the things that mattered. And later, the small things became bigger things. And whenever I look at this quote, I'm reminded by him. In learning, you will teach, but in teaching, you will learn. And this is the importance. This is the gift of giving. This is where we actually have to spend time with people and we need to teach them what it is that we care about. My dad, cool, calm head, in the middle of a war zone, he wouldn't give a damn. It would be simple for him. He would just keep moving. So what I want to start with are the lessons that I learned from my father. <laughs> the lessons that I learned from my father. So we all started somewhere whether it was in the arms of your parents or whether it was in an incubator, never forget where you're from because that's the one thing that keeps you grounded. It's the one thing that keeps you motivated and it's the one thing that keeps you going no matter what. Embrace the struggle. What is in the way becomes the way. People keep reminding you of why you can't do things. People keep reminding you of why you won't succeed. But that's the point. Use that as motivation. And celebrate the small things. The small things are the things that really matter. The small things 
are the things that become big things, and that's what make life worth living. They make people feel. The old man has a way of making people feel. And Maya Angelou said that people will always forget what you said, people will always forget what you did, but they will never forget how you made them feel. And we were put on this planet to feel. And finally, life's too short. Life's too short to not make amazing connections and to not share your experiences. My challenge to you is, is to share your experiences. I've told you what my father taught me. What did your, you father, your father teach you? Everybody get up. Our next speaker is Stephanie Zhu, and her uh, title is A New China in Africa. Um, how many of you have been to China? Raise your hand. Oh, wow, a lot. Yay. Okay. So, um, $188 billion in trade, $21 billion in foreign investment. Oh, there we go. $108 billion in trade, $21 billion in infrastructure, 25% growth in the past five years, 10,000 companies operating in Africa as the continent. I know Africa is a continent, not a country. Um, so out of that, a third in manufacturing, um, a quarter in services, the rest in real estate, construction, and trade. No one cares, right? Um, so if, effectively, if you haven't been there, you've like been there already. Um, so then my question is, for all the things that everyone has talked about today, from AI to BRIC to all those great um, inventions and companies here, with Africa's leapfrogging the Silicon Savannah, why are Chinese not investing in tech, right? So in order to answer that question, let's move back to what they've been doing in traditional business. So what have we learned? Number one, they are very focused. They're practical and they're insular. They focus on one project, one railroad, one road, whatever it is, and they bring in all those, their own people. They bring in massive tribes of Chinese. There's lots of people who look like me when you like go into like corners of random places of Africa. But the reason that the Chinese aren't investing in tech is because tech is collaborative and inclusive. It is everything that my people fight against. But it's not because they're not trying, right? Alibaba brought in $10 million to invest in Chinese entrepreneurs. Um, Naspers, those of you who are here, owns 27% in Tencent. Um, and Huawei educates 12,000 students here, but still only accounts for 15% of their entire company. So the new age of China-Africa tech collaboration is in technology. Let's unpack that for a second, right? So number one, collaboration. Why is that not working? Number one reason is because Neither Chinese nor African companies know how to contextualize their learnings within the current ecosystems and environments. Number two, technology. It's because neither VCs nor startups really think about these macro, large, big picture, slow moving uh, events. They think about technology, trends, and teamwork. So how can we get these people to focus more on China tech, uh, China-Africa tech collaboration, right? So let's, let's think about McKinsey. McKinsey gives us lots of really great um, pointers to do China-Africa collaboration on. Um, we're going to focus on the last three, uh, which is brownfield growth operations um, and African and Chinese companies figuring out how to play within the private sector. Number one is peer-to-peer -peer knowledge transfer. Um, how can we get companies to talk to other companies? Uh, why would we reinvent the wheel when we're driving on the same terrain? A lot of the same problems that Africa uh, is facing today, China faced 5, 10, 15 years ago. Um, so how many of you work for African companies that successfully collaborated with Chinese companies today? Everyone talked about great things today, and I'm so excited, but the reason this matters is literally because this will make you money, right? Um, so I'm here to ignite something, which is a new China-African collaboration. Um, where we can talk more openly, we can talk more candidly, we can talk like we actually care, we're not here just to make money like I just mentioned. Um, <laughs> so if you're interested to know more about the companies that do care and want to do things with you guys, then let me know. Thank you. MJ Khan, MJ's title is What Fairy Tales Have Taught Me About Digital. So he's going to take us through, and then after that, we're going to we're going to vote. Hi, everybody! First time on stage. Quite excited about that. I'm actually going to spend 
my first 15 seconds just thanking the previous 15 speakers before me because I thought they did an amazing job. I hope you're gonna clap for them. I'm sure that's my wife and tell her it's all me. So I'm gonna take all that credit. But yeah, <laughs> thanks for that. So this evening, I'm gonna talk about three things. I'm gonna talk about context, I'm gonna talk about discovery, and deadlines. Discovery for me is, I'm gonna discover whether I can actually do this in 15 seconds at a time, but the most important thing really is context. And I'm gonna start off by quoting Swiss philosopher, Alain de Botton. This is my favorite quote of all time. He says, most of what makes a book good is that we're reading it at the right moment for us. And that's very really powerful, the idea of context. Swap book with movie, with film, with whatever it is. Most of what makes it good is that we're doing it at the right moment for us. So let's talk about a few uh, fairy tales. I want to start off with Aladdin. And I'm not going to assume everybody knows all these things. So Aladdin's basically about a man who elevated his position by marrying into royalty. And the problem with Aladdin really is just the use of lazy stereotypes. That's what I've learned from that movie, just in terms of how they depict people. And for digital, what I've learned is that I should never ever fall back on stereotypes, treat people as individuals. The second movie, which was The Little Mermaid, I actually watched that about 10 years ago for the first time. And again, that's about interspecies sexuality, and again, just having fun with that. And what I really learned, from The Little Mermaid is the target market. Like, I didn't like that movie. And my friend told me something so profound. He said, the reason why you didn't like it is because you're not the target market. <laughs> and I, that really stuck with me. I thought about that, you know? We dismiss things because we're not the target market. The third tale, uh, The Emperor's New Clothes. And again, this is a tale about social media experts who lie to someone that they can get ROI from something and they con them into wearing a suit. And, and what I learned from that is the bubble. We're so insular, you know, when it comes to digital, we search for our own keywords and we have these little islands and we give ourselves relevance, but no one outside of the bubble cares about us, you know? No one goes to bed thinking about their favorite brands. And the last story I want to talk about is Hansel and Gretel, which is about unbundling. Basically, an evil stepmother pushing these two kids out of the house. And there's three really important lessons here when it comes to Hansel and Gretel. The first lesson is the idea of breadcrumbs. So what happened is Hansel and Gretel, their dad, pushed them off into the forest, but they were able to find their way back home because they left little breadcrumbs to allow them to get back home. And for me, that's so important, you know, tracking those user journeys and understanding where people are coming from. So that's a big lesson I took from it. The second lesson is measurement. So the witch, she wants to fatten up Hansel uh, so she could eat him, right? Because, you know, people like me are more delicious. And what used to happen is he gave her a chicken bone each time she wanted to see whether he was fat. And that's, she was measuring the wrong things. And the last thing, the most important thing is you go and build a beautiful gingerbread house with licorice wheels and you only attract two kids. That's pathetic ROI. <laughs> Horrible. Put paid media, drive traffic to where you want to go and eat more kids. <laughs> So I'm going to end up one more time with a quote. Think about that. Most of what makes the book good is that we're reading it at the right moment for us. There are stories out there. Go out, enjoy them, embrace them. And of course, have fun. Thank you so much. OK, cool. So what, what we're going to do now is going to ask all the speakers to come on stage. The winner is Brony. <laughs> okay, cool. So we've got obvious winner, Brody Martin. <laughs>